Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Lost Bits right here on Tetra Bay Gaming, the series where we explore the scrapped, unused, and unseen content in video games. So recently, the main story of Bendy and the Ink Machine has seemingly come to an end with the release of the fifth and final chapter, The Last Reel. Thankfully, Chapter 5 and the Bonus Archives chapter has some noteworthy unseen and unused content for us to explore. If you haven't yet checked out my Lost Bits on chapters 1 through 4, I highly recommend you check those out after this video. Also, should go without saying, but this video will contain spoilers for those who haven't yet played through this chapter. So, here's your warning. And anyways, with all of that said, it's time to revisit Joey Drew Studios and find some Lost Bits. So first off, I just want to go over something that I mentioned in my previous video. In my video covering the first two chapters, I had mentioned that there was a set of unused textures found in the files for the prototype of chapter 1. Just as was predicted, this mask and these gloves were in fact meant for a previously unseen prototype version of Bendy, which is now modeled and shown off in the game's bonus archive chapter. It is shown that this version of Bendy would basically split his head down the middle to open his mouth. Yikes. I'm really glad that they revealed this early design to us though. Overall, the archive chapter is really cool, it's almost like a playable version of my Lost Bits video which went over how the different models had evolved. Alright, now let's go over some of the textures and graphics that I believe to be unused in chapter 5. I have looked around for these basically everywhere and nowhere could I find them being used. As of the making of this video, the newest chapter is less than a week old, so it is likely some of these may be found or added in the future. So if they are, be sure to let me know down in the comments. Anyways, first up are a few unseen, or at least unfound, secret messages. As you may know, in Chapter 5 we are introduced to the handheld seeing tool Lightbox, which acts like the lens of truth from The Legend of Zelda and reveals secret messages when looking through it. The three secret messages that I was unable to find are, I will set us free, more than just a cartoon, and a heart. There is a secret drawing of a heart on a box in chapter 4, believed to be a reference to the companion cubes from the Portal series. So maybe it was supposed to be here at one point instead. Another area that it might have been intended for is down in level 14 in chapter 3, where Henry is tasked to collect some ink hearts. I Will Set Us Free looks very similar to the He Will Set Us Free message seen in the beginning of Chapter 2. So my best guess is that this would have been a hidden message layered over top of it. I don't really know where more than just a cartoon would have been used as it sounds like it could be used pretty much anywhere, but my best guess is the artist room in the first chapter. Next, let's have a look at the textures used for the ending cutscene in Joey Drew's apartment. Most of the textures in these files are used, but some are normally unseen like this smell like success box and this upside down truck blanket, but we'll talk more about those later. So you may have noticed the several newspapers littered around the apartment, but normally it's pretty hard to read what's actually written on them. Thankfully, by looking at the high resolution textures, we can read a few of the headlines and see that all of the newspapers appear to be from different parts of the world and from different parts of the 20th century. There's one discussing the Second World War and then another celebrating Princess Diana's 30th birthday. But wait, Princess Diana was born in 1961, meaning that this newspaper was from 1991. However, the calendar on the wall in the apartment shows that this takes place in the year 1963. So either A, there's some serious time traveling going on, B, these are just some stock newspaper textures and I'm reading way too much into this, or C, Joey really likes that calendar and refuses to take it down even decades after 1963 passes. Other headlines discuss a supposed Bigfoot sighting in Scandinavia, a shark attack in the South, and a fake radio war stir in the United States. The last one might be referring to the famous radio dramatization of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds in 1938, which many radio listeners believed the dramatization to be a real news broadcast and thought aliens really were invading Earth. Something about the picture here seems off though. It seems to be way too high of a resolution compared to everything else. At first, I thought it was a picture of one of the developers, 
but I couldn't really match it up with any of them. If any of you know who this is, please let me know. Next is a newspaper that appears to be some sort of weird spoof of Jethro Tull's album Thick as a Brick. There are several similarities. The Jethro title in the corner here turned into Rullum Tree, the crest at the top, the placement of all the text, and even parts of the same article. No idea if there's any deeper meaning here, but I'm guessing whoever made this was just trying to change it enough to avoid copyright infringement. It's still pretty weird to think a spoof Jethro Tull album exists in Bendy though. The last interesting headline reads, Local artist pushed himself too hard, found dead at desk. This headline might be a reference to the Bendy protagonist Henry who was once an artist at Joey Drew Studios. It says the artist pushed himself too hard, and at the end of the game, Joey tells Henry that he should have pushed a little harder. Henry also finds his old desk in Chapter 1 and Chapter 5, and comments about how much time he wasted at it. Coincidences? Probably, but either way, something to think about. The lore implications don't end there either. There are several textures of what appear to be notes written by the employees at Joey Drew Studios. First is a to-do list made by Sammy Lawrence, reminding him to finish the soundtrack for the Tombstone Picnic episode of the cartoon, record the Alice Angel voiceover from Allison Pendle after she replaced Susie Campbell, and a reminder to get the Bendy cutouts out of the recording studio, which he states that they keep multiplying, as we also saw in Chapter 2. Next are some cartoon ideas which based on the handwriting appear to be written by Joey himself. And then there are some ride ideas for Bendyland, probably written out by Bertram Piedmont, the creator of the Bendyland amusement park. I don't know if you noticed yet, but it's pretty funny that there's a typo left in this note. The last note is what appears to be some sort of poem that was written out to Joey Drew for an unknown reason, to which he responds that it needs more use of the word dreaming. Next up in this same texture is a design document of the ink machine created by Wally Franks. You know, the designer of the ink machine that has hardly any importance to the plot of the story? Yeah, him. Apart from the ink and coffee stains, we are shown what certain parts of the machine are, as well as a remark from Joey Drew requesting that it should have more pipes. The last interesting unused texture appears to be writing on what looks to be a greasy bag of fast food. It's hard to make it out in this texture, but there's another texture that we can clearly read that this bag says All Burger, probably some McDonald's-like fast food chain. There is an All Burger bag visible near the garbage in Joey Drew's apartment, but it has no visible writing. The written messages are as follows. The creator lied to us. Don't touch Boris. Chapter 3, Change Drop Rate of Items, which was apparently fixed. The names of the three Butcher Gang members, Barley, Charlie, and Edgar, and some writing just saying, Me, Bendy? The most interesting one to me by far is the one mentioning the drop rate of items in Chapter 3. This is basically breaking the fourth wall and is something a developer of the game would write themselves. And the item drop rate was a complaint I believe many people had with Chapter 3, which did get fixed as far as I know. But why would Joey have written this on a bag of fast food? This almost makes it seem like Joey is some sort of omnipresent godlike figure in Bendy and the Ink Machine with the ability to control things like how often enemies drop items. Now I'm not a big theory guy myself, but I'm sure this has to have some meaning, right? Surprisingly, I haven't seen anyone talk about these yet, but I feel like it's a pretty big discovery. Let me know what you guys think. Is it just a joke by the developers, or is it something more? And lastly here, although it is used, the label on the record is really hard to read normally, but viewing the texture it is much easier to read that the title of the album is Symphonies of Death. Pretty morbid. Alright, moving along, there is so far one audio file that is unused, and it's just of Henry asking, Joey? This file is found right after the file in which Joey says, The end. Before vanquishing Big Boy Ink Demon, so either this would have been used right as Henry meets Joey at the end, or it may be possible that at one point it would have been revealed that Joey was the Ink Demon all along. Henry does sound surprised in the unused clip, so I wouldn't necessarily rule out the latter. 
And again, as usual for the last stop of this video, let's have a look at some of the normally unseen stuff in Chapter 5, as well as in the archives. So at the end of the super long, and unskippable, intro cutscene, Alice and Tom leave you for dead as they fear the ink demon is approaching. But where do they go, you might be wondering? Well, after we break out, it looks like they didn't get too far. Tom is found motionless just off to the left in his hallway behind the wall, and Alice is found on the opposite side, again, just behind the wall. I always enjoy finding these models that the developers hide just outside of normal view. Just up ahead is the next hidden secret of this chapter. Beside the bed frame, there's what looks like a caved in and boarded up path. Naturally, I thought I should look past it, and I'm glad I did as behind it there is a large room with a door. The door doesn't open, or even function at all for that matter, but just look at this. There is no way this didn't or won't have a purpose at some point. The bed frame is also the image used for selecting chapter 5, so maybe there is more to this area than we know. I'm thinking maybe this might be opened in a future update like we saw in cases in the previous chapters. Fingers crossed. Later on we can see Alice and Tom zipping away in their boat. I was curious to see if they actually do drive all the way to their destination, but it looks like they just disappear when they go out of view. Of course I had to try and see what the giant hands look like from under the ink, but it was a bit easier said than done as for some reason the game wasn't letting me clip through the boat at first. But it turns out that after you let one of the hands kill you and then respawn, the hands that were loaded previously are still hiding under the ink. So here you are, this is what they look like in full. Interestingly enough, the hand that pulls down the boat that Tom and Alice used is also still found under the ink, still gripping onto the boat. And speaking of Tom and Alice, they end up going through this here door. And at first you assume that this is where you are supposed to go as well, before having to turn and run from the ink hand. But turns out that behind the door is just a lot of nothing. If you've played this chapter, you also know that Sammy Lawrence makes a return here in which he jump scares you before fighting you. If we fly behind him without triggering the jump scare, we can see him just chilling. To my disappointment, he isn't asserting his dominance with a T-pose like he did in Chapter 2. After the super drawn out fight with like 200 searchers and lost ones, there is a hallway that we need to traverse, but unfortunately Henry ends up falling 50 meters. So let's find out what's really at the end of this hallway. Although it is actually textured and you can still walk on the boards, there really isn't much else to see here on either side. Moving along, we approach Joey Drew's office area. One really cool thing I found here is how the effect of the Ink Demon's presence is made. So after you make the first pipe fitting, Ink starts covering the walls, which in previous chapters is a sign that Bendy is near. The first few times I played this, it scared me and I hid in the little miracle station. But then I was curious to see where he was actually walking, but I could never find him. That is, until I remembered that there was an upper floor in this room. I found this floor earlier, but I didn't really know what its purpose was as it looked like just a normal hallway, but it's not visible normally as it is darkened. But it turns out that this is actually where Bendy walks when he is here. In my livestream, I even made a joke about how the only platforms up here are not behind any of the doors. But after learning that this is how Bendy comes in and leaves, it all made sense. While getting the ink to build the pipe fittings in my first playthrough, this broken wall stood out to me as it didn't really seem to make a lot of sense. Thankfully, I decided to check it out because behind it is ya boy, Sinny. For those of you that don't know, the Wandering Sin Bendy Cutouts, or as I like to call them, Sinny, are creepy looking cutouts that the developers of this game hide in areas that they think snooping players will look as a sort of deterrence. Although not as elaborate as the one Sinny we found in Chapter 4, it was nice to see him make an appearance here. Unfortunately however, this is the only Sinny that I was able to find in this chapter. Normally, before entering the vault, there is a room flooded with ink that you have to drain. 
But if we skip past the room, oddly enough we can still open the door from the other side, and the ink remains in place. Now that's what I call... Fluid Dynamics. After exiting the vault, we get to a hallway in which the ink demon walks by. When getting here the first time, I thought for sure there would have been a Cine found somewhere in there. Like it's such an obvious place that snooping players would explore, but alas there are no wandering sins to be found. There's even these empty rooms with functioning doors, like come on, definitely a missed opportunity if you ask me. And you know what would have been awesome? If they added a secret wandering sin in one of these rooms that you could only see through the seeing tool. Now that would have been slick. Moving on, just before the final boss, a few of you wanted a closer look at the ink machine being lowered into the... Bigger ink machine. Nothing too crazy to see here unfortunately, but I guess we can see the back of it, which is normally not visible as far as I can remember. There unfortunately wasn't anything noteworthy in the boss fight area, so let's move on to the ending cutscene. So off the get go, the first thing I wanted to check out was the slightly opened door to the bathroom in Joey's bedroom. And although it was very alluring, it's really dark inside and there's nothing really here. But here's where the cool stuff starts. So the last scene in this chapter is the camera moving to a picture of the main characters of the cartoon, where Henry's last name is revealed. On the way there, we can see some sort of ink machine in the adjacent room. Turns out it's still there in the area that we get to move around in. It was a bit tricky to explore as normally if you get anywhere near it, the game will actually suck you into the ending cutscene in which you can't move around. But after playing around with the game's code, I was able to disable the cutscene and explore to my heart's content. So here you go, here is a closer look at the mysterious ink machine we are teased with at the end of the game. In this room are also several boxes that I mentioned earlier that we don't get to see anywhere else, as well as the upside down blanket covering the window, which again, we normally don't get to take a good look at. Moving on to the kitchen with free reign, we can now move around to take a look at some more stuff we normally can't up close. Like this magazine on the table, and inside Joey Drew's head. Nice eyeballs you got there. And the same picture from the end scene is also still found here in the kitchen, even though again, normally I don't think there's any way you would be able to turn to see it. While we're in the kitchen, let's talk about the date which appears on the calendar here. If you've played through this ending more than once, or watched it on more than one channel, you may have noticed that the date seems to change every time to a different day in August. And if you remember the calendar in the other room, August 31st is circled in red, and it is the only circled date suggesting that it has to be of some importance. Many fans have theorized that if you end up in this area on August 31st, a special ending will occur. Unfortunately though, when digging through the game's code, I found a command which basically generates a number for the kitchen calendar between 1 and 30. So no, there is no way to influence what day it is when you get there, and unless there is a secret way to change the calendar to the 31st in a way that I didn't find in the code, getting here on August 31st is currently impossible. I guess only time will tell what the significance of August 31st is. And lastly for this chapter, as a nod to the twist at the end where Joey sends you back to restart the cycle in chapter 1, the back of the door you exit through is stylized like the cartoonish doors we see everywhere else in the game. A nice little easter egg for those who like to snoop. And finally, let's quickly check out the bonus archives chapter. Given that the whole area here is quite small, there is only one thing to talk about. As soon as I played this chapter for the first time, I noticed this door that said, Danger Keep Out, and I knew that had to be bait. This archive room shows all of the variations of Bendy, except one. So behind this door and to the left, on the wall is, you guessed it, one final Cine. Unfortunately, this one doesn't make the creepy sound like the other ones do, I'm guessing because it's super close to where you spawn, so it would have been a dead giveaway. I'm glad the devs left him in here as a final send off to one of my favorite hidden easter eggs in a game. Till we meet again, old friend. 
And with that concludes this third Lost Bits video on Bendy and the Ink Machine, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to let me know with a like down below, it seriously helps me out a lot. Also, if you haven't yet watched my Lost Bits videos on chapters 1 to 4, you can do so by clicking on the card right here, which will take you to the first video. If you're new here and would like to stay even more up to date with me and the channel, be sure to subscribe here as well as follow me over on my other social media things which will all be linked in the description below. But as always guys, thank you all so much for watching today and for all of your amazing support, and I will see you in a bit.